All right, well, we'll start. So uh, we've talked about the leader's character, uh, the leader's now I've lost, I've lost it all. So anyway, tonight we're talking about uh, the leader's agenda. And we'll do that tonight and then the next two weeks, and then we'll be done. So, uh, and I gave you some information here related to uh, when it comes to biblical servant leadership. When we talk about the agenda, we're talking about the divine agenda, what the leader pursues as the defined mission. So everything has to do with the mission. That's the agenda. That's what, as servant leaders, we don't choose the mission. It's given to us by our Lord. And uh, I put in here, you know, I, there's a lot of disagreement about this. We talk about we want visionary leaders. I don't think the Lord is real impressed with that. He's already told us what we need to know. The real issue is how, how compelling is what he's already told us. And every leader has to decide that for themselves. And we'll talk more about that tonight. Uh, is it enough or do we have to dream up something else to add to it? But I really think the Lord has already been pretty clear. Uh, and so for our purposes, for what we're doing, we're not going to talk about the content of the divine agenda as much as we're going to talk about how the servant leader goes about accomplishing that agenda effectively. And uh, tonight we'll start with this whole idea of clarity, especially related to the mission, the mission that God has given to us. Uh, regardless of what organization we are a part, why we gather together is going to be of central purpose. The mission, the purpose, it's going to be the compelling thing. Why do we gather? Why do we cooperate together? And as a church, that's real important. And so communication is a top priority for leadership, no matter the organization. Why do we do what we do? So, after we uh, establish the importance of the mission and we communicate that clearly, the next thing is the whole idea of accountability. So once we've communicated the purpose as best we can, then we can hold people accountable to that purpose. So we'll talk about accountability next week. And then after accountability, the, the next step is to work for the success of others. We've given them the purpose. We've, uh, we're, we're going to hold them accountable to that purpose. Now, how do we equip them and serve them so that they can succeed at that purpose? And so we'll talk about that the week after. So this week, we're talking about clarity. Next week, we talk about uh, accountability. And then the week after that, we'll talk about Equipping people to succeed. How do we serve them so that they can succeed? This week, we're talking about clarity. So, if leadership is about motivating and guiding people, which it is, then communication is absolutely essential. And if the divine agenda is so essential, then it's essential also that leaders communicate that effectively. If the mission that God has given us as a church, as individual believers, uh, whatever it is that God has called us to, if that's so important, then we need to be able to communicate that purpose, that mission, as effectively as we can. Now, Cynthia, the good news is, is that it doesn't mean that all leaders will be great public speakers. <laughs> uh, Even with practice. Yes. But... Uh, I think by necessity, we'll be as effective as we can be. That's the goal. We want to be as effective and as clear as we can be about what we're communicating. Some are just naturally gifted. That's always going to be the case. Uh, but I think we can learn to be as skilled and effective and as clear as we possibly can be. Um, you're... We talked about situation comedies a little while ago. Did you ever watch one of those shows and uh, there was a misunderstanding? Some kind of everyone. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that the whole time. just a big misunderstanding. So, uh, you know, in our in our in our relationships and in our families and where we work and in the organizations of which we're a part, so much depends upon the healthiness of and the clarity of our communication. 
Are we are we actually communicating what needs to be communicated? How and when and is it effective and all of those things? So we'll talk about that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's begin to consider this just from a biblical perspective. So look at first Corinthians chapter 15. Couples, families, and leadership teams that don't communicate or that communicate poorly are prone to misunderstandings, anger, bitterness, and a failure to reconcile after the conflict. So research shows consistently that uh, just something that we tend to not even pay a lot of attention to, how we are communicating, can make or break whether or not we are actually accomplishing our purpose, our common purpose together. And this is especially important as, as Christians. And so Paul addresses this in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Um, and then it goes on, and you're familiar with probably, we use that around Easter time a lot. So what was Paul's message? Christ died and was raised on the third day according to the scripture. Yeah, he died for our sins. It's, it's pretty simple. This is a pretty direct and one of the most direct places where Paul spells out just as clearly as simply as he can the content of his message. Uh, and he said, you know, I passed on to you. This is of, of first importance, primary importance. There's nothing higher. This is what's important. And so it's a very simple message. So simple that it was sometimes dismissed as foolishness. If you looked in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul talks about Jews demand a sign. Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. Uh, the whole idea of Christ crucified, resurrected, foolishness to some people, in, uh, to, to Jews and to Greeks. Uh, for some people, the, the message of the cross was a liability, but for Paul, what truly counted was whether the message had the power to transform lives. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24, it says, But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. In Romans 1, 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So for Paul... His message was worth communicating because he believed it changed people's lives. It transformed lives. Uh, it was compelling for him. And we've talked about this before. Uh, Paul's life was definitely changed by his encounter with Jesus Christ. Uh, no question. It had, it had changed his life so dramatically, he believed it could do that to anybody. So to be successful, Leaders must have a clear and cogent message which can be transmitted well and put into practice effectively. Why are we here? Why are we doing what we do? I think as clearly and as concisely and as cogently as we can say that, then the more likely it is we will be doing it. And uh, it can be passed on to others. So our church, uh, I've been real proud and I didn't have anything to do with this. All of this was done before I came to the church. But our church's mission statement, you know, to, to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Jesus Christ, is, it's pretty good. Uh, and, uh, you know, we shorten it to put it on all kinds of stuff, being shaped by the love of Christ. It's short, it's cogent, it's to the point, it can be transmitted easily. I like it. it could we do better? Of course. I mean, Jeff... Him. He was always trying to think of a better mission statement. And he never came up with one that I thought was better. He came up with some good ones. But, you know, why do you need to reinvent the wheel? Just chill out. You know, we have a good one. He could never, you know, ours is good. Whoever came up with it, and I've heard lots of anecdotal stories. <coughs> who's responsible? Uh, but they did a great job, and I'm so thankful for it. All right. 
The next thing, effective communicators must understand their audience. So give me some examples of how Jesus clearly understood his audience. The parables. What about the parables? Well, they always, the stories that he told were always something that the audience at the time could understand. It came out of their life understanding. It was something they could easily relate to. Okay. So literally, to ca a parable is a story that casts things alongside one another. And so Jesus would take, especially in an agrarian society, images and routines they were familiar with, and he would compare those, cast that alongside what he was trying to get them to see about the kingdom of God. And they would make the comparisons. Uh, he did not talk to them about how the kingdom of God is similar to math. <laughs> he talked about how the kingdom of God resembled sowing seed and, and harvesting crops and things of that nature. Finding a pearl, you know, great prize of this treasure. And so, yeah, how else, what else can you think of? How did Jesus understand his audience? He dealt with the Pharisees. All right, talk to me about that. How does that show? What did he understand? Um, the reluctance to see him as the Messiah. It's good me. It's all right. <laughs> okay, so uh, you could say, it'd be fair to say, Jesus understood the Pharisees, didn't he? He understood them. So much so that there were times where he had some pretty telling and harsh words for them. Whitewashed tombs, those sorts of things. He did understand them. And he communicated clearly to them and helped them. It's pretty clear. Any other examples you can think of? How did Jesus communicate? How did he understand his audience? He saw the the, the emptiness and, and, and the frustration of society and the oppressiveness that they went through. Yes. Um, they're deeply, what the book says, deeply felt needs and Good. was able to connect with that. Yes. So, uh, he, like sheep without a shepherd. And so uh, he, all of their deeply felt needs addressed issues like poverty, injustice, piety, faithfulness of the law, hypocrisy, loving your enemies, daily sustenance, forgiveness, reconciliation, everything that, they, that was important to them. He understood what they were going through and spoke to them there. All right, what about Paul? What are some examples of how Paul could read his audience? Going to the Areopagus and seeing the many gods. And yeah. He addressed the, the one true God that he knew and he used the creator angle to do it. Down Mars Hill. Uh, so uh, all of those gods there and then the altar to the unknown God. And he used that as a way of uh, proclaiming Christ to the Greeks that were there. Um, and so that's a good example from Acts seventeen or Acts thirteen. I, mean, I think there were times he didn't understand his audience. Right. Give me an example. Um, it was during the riot. <laughs> yeah. And he, let me out! Let me out! No, Paul, they're going to kill you! Let me out! Oh, they're tell them. So he had to be persuaded. <laughs> yeah. uh, exactly. So, uh, but for both Jesus and Paul. Uh, we get an idea that they um, they spoke the word of the Lord, but they spoke it in a way that it connected with the people. They understood the people well enough and loved the people enough to make that connection. And so uh, there's a lot of things that probably could be said, but we want to make sure that we're saying it in a way that people that is connecting with the people that we're wanting. Receive that message. So Paul knew the Jews inside and out, and he knew the changes that he needed to communicate to them. Yes. Yes. He's also a Roman. Yes. You and both. You and both. All right. The third thing uh, effective communication requires good listening skills. So look over in uh, James chapter 1. <clears throat> it 
So he says, come on. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Yay. And then verse 20. Uh, For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. So here, uh, what does it mean to be quick to listen? Yeah, let's say God gave you two ears and one mouth <laughs> for a reason. And what is that reason? I figured it out. <laughs> I think my mother named me wrong. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to do is to seek to, to, to fully understand so that you can address now what you're understanding to alleviate the preconceptions and the thoughts and, and, and avoid our society bad at this. Because there's so much noise, you know, you expect, you know, something because you've already heard or had this feeling about something. And so you've already prejudged. You just have to be honest. So you have somebody approach us other than wife, it's all the time. <laughs> you may think you know, yeah. but uh, you really, really have to rely on God to, to slow yourself down. So it's actually the opposite of what we think is quick. Don't be so quick to think this is how he or she is actually feeling because we are so quick to look for labels and cross by, oh, well, you're going here that's the issue for oh this is about finances mm -hmm. two weeks ago or a discussion we had three weeks ago or whatever or you're still holding this over my head therefore i already expect you to come to me with whatever and so we have to slow down mm -hmm. and be sure we hear the entire thing. that's hard it is because we're in a rat race more times than not we're trying to accomplish go and do and move we have to settle this thing instead of that's what they used to teach us when we work at the bank. If anybody came into your office and sat at your desk, that is more, it's, it's, it's important for you to listen to what they have to say because then you may not provide them but what they need, the help that they need, and you're going to give them something wrong that's going to be harmful, be worse for their finances. So that was one thing we learned, they always taught us. <coughs> listen and hear what they're saying. But don't start talking while they're talking because then you're not going to hear everything that they need. And in training teachers, mm -hmm. as well as law officers, mm -hmm. you would learn to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. it, was, it really was. It was awareness, not only of what's being said, but position. And that was talked about before. Mm -hmm. you know, trying to read the, read the, the you know, situation and be aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And this is not a person, this is a parent, this is somebody who's really distraught or whatever and try to depersonalize that thing to begin with and de-escalate it. Mm -hmm. And now, since we're not fearing, we can actually hear and assess the situation and come up with the right words to say, instead of being so quick. Because we can we can escalate something in a hurry by saying the wrong thing with our wives or otherwise, yeah. you know, or anybody who's upset. Well, just calm down. Sometimes it's not well, the best way to lead. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's something you have to train yourself that's right. Too often we're waiting for our turn to talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're not, even if we're doing that respectfully, we may not be listening and hearing what the other person is saying. We're just waiting for our turn. In uh, de escalation, they, they always say well, when the other person is done speaking, you say, This is what I heard you say. Am I correct? Yep. Hmm. So then James says, uh, be slow to speak. So uh, this gets at what John is talking about. Um, uh, being able to speak so that we communicate to that person that we heard them, that we can understand what they're saying. This is what I heard. So you're saying what I hear you saying is, and so that the other person can either affirm that or correct our understanding. Too often we hear what we want to hear rather than what is actually being communicated. 
And so I want to be slow enough to process what it's saying and that when I do speak, I think, I want to be able to make sure that what I'm communicating is that I've heard you. I've heard you. Now it's my turn to talk. <laughs> and then he says about the anger, why is being slow to anger an important listening skill? Two angry people don't accomplish it. Is that, is that your experience? Yeah. <laughs> it, can, it can be a good fight. That's For sure, because right. you get to a point where you don't even hear anymore, you're so mad. You just flip your lid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you go from conversation to wanting to win to get your point across. Yes. Uh -huh. And sometimes you're not even on the same page. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I mean, here, uh, what happens <laughs> is we tend to overreact. We don't just react, we over. And so your instincts work against, you know, our instincts work against us here. Usually the first thing that responds is uh, the brain stem, the fight or flight instinct. And uh, neither one of those is good in a communication situation, fighting or flight. That's not what we're trying to do. The next thing to kick in is the amygdala, which is our emotions. And again, uh, if, if I'm already instinctually I'm ready to fight, and then my emotions kick in, uh, look, out. look out. And that's when the overreaction comes, or I just break down crying. <laughs> you know? Yes. And, and it's just, there's no communicating that takes place. Usually the last thing to kick in is that prefrontal cortex, where God gave us the ability to think and to pray and reflect. Uh, that reasonable part of our brain is the last one. And so we want to make sure that we're calmed down <coughs> enough to give our prefrontal cortex the opportunity to kick in the way that God created us. And uh, then we can... You know, so not, is, is life the same as, let me just walk away from the situation and then think about it and then so, go back and have a more so calming discussion? There's always this dance. And yeah. God created us, I think, with, with the need to be separate and then the need to come together. And when our instincts kick in and we, and we experience that flight, we, then we're pulling away, which is an okay thing as long as we come back. Right. The problem is, is when we don't. Right. And that turns into emotional cutoff mm -hmm. and that, you know, families can be isolated from that. that was nice. so, so, you know, the, that, 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 that pulling away is fine because sometimes we need that to give our prefrontal cortex the opportunity to kick in. Mm -hmm. That's okay, as long as we're coming back together. And uh, usually we're not good at saying, I'm just going to need about 15 minutes here and then we can talk about it. Instead, we just walk off and we don't say anything. You know? So we have to be careful. Um, so uh, James really gets in, I think the whole anger thing gets into the de-escalation thing that John and Byron were talking about. Uh, uh, Proverbs 15.1 <laughs> A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, have you found that to be true? Yeah. So look at Ephesians four now. Ephesians 4, 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. Uh, Christ Jesus. So, ultimately, the goal of communication should be the same as our goal in all leadership functions, which is to choose words, to build others up rather than to break them down. And so in verse four, in, in chapter four, verse 15 here, what is involved in speaking the truth in love? Being calm. Being calm, perhaps. Not 
should we say truth? You, you want to say true things. Okay. What does that mean? Can you tell me what do you have in mind? Is it just not saying, not lying? I think that it goes beyond that because in my understanding it's something that has to be in accordance with the truth. Oh, okay. I mean, yes, we're not going to, you know, don't want to lie, but I think that it goes beyond that for believers because we're wanting to speak truth into people's lives. Okay, to speak the truth of God's word. <clears throat> yes. I would agree. And then also uh, what Byron was saying about prejudging, uh, making, letting our assumptions, uh, that's not what we want to say. I assume all kinds of things about it, and I might communicate with you according to all of those assumptions. And that's all there are, assumptions, just things I assume to be true, ways that I've prejudged you. And what God wants me to do is to not do that. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to speak the truth, I want to make sure that it's the truth. So the difference is, you know, if Kim and I are having an argument, and uh, yeah, that never happens. Oh gosh, <laughs> she says that. Uh, you know, I now I can't even think of an example. Well, let's not show real, real, real examples. <laughs> That's why struggling. You can't even pick them up with it. But, but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, that, we've all had them. That uh, I assume something about her that is true, and it may not only be unfair, it may be untrue. And so I can say, I can make an accusation, or I can ask you know, two different things. But uh, I want to make sure that when I speak the truth, that it is actually something that is correct and true. But then he says to do it in love. What does that mean? Well, that's like when your wife comes to you, to you and says, does this dress make me look pretty? Or oh, does this gosh. dress make me look fat? <laughs> what do you do? You have to speak in love. Yes. Yeah. Um, you look lovely. I get the truth. I appreciate it. I don't want to walk out of the house looking <laughs> Well, there's a way to do it. Oh, yeah, he's kind of I'm saying I appreciate it. You, you don't want your husband to go, man, that looks, too, you look horrible in that. I know four fat people. You're three of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's, it's the wrong one. It's the wrong one. It's not the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to be careful. Yeah. Right? I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's also, I think what they're trying to get at is organizational maturity. And with leadership maturity, and, and if you have someone in your leadership team that's not going in the right direction, and and you need to bring them back in, um, you need to do it, back it up with scripture, and and talk to them in love, in a way that you want to help encourage them to make the right decision and come back into the fold. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, redemptive. <laughs> We're working in someone's long-term best interests. So when we speak the truth to them, we're trying to bring about what's best for them. They're still human beings. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right, look at, at Colossians 4, 6. So uh, here Paul says, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer it. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So, uh, how can our conversations be full of grace? Can you say this? And the other one in involved. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lifting them up. Or lifting the situation up. Yes. Your leader, and somebody comes underneath you comes up and and says something or does something and it's just it's a wreck if you if you want to help them you don't destroy them by telling them how bad they screwed up yeah. you can point out where they went wrong without being demeaning <laughs> yeah. 
Grace, full of grace. What about seasoned with salt? How do you understand that? Maybe. <laughs> salt is the right amount salt. of salt makes things taste good. It filters through the whole steak. You know, I mean, if you marinate that steak 24 hours, you know, it's gonna, it's just gonna permeate through the entire steak, and you put it on that that pit with the heat fire and the smoke. And All that good stuff. So it just, it, it just kind of filters through. Yeah, I'm gonna go home and get done. Yes. Right. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. Right. Right. But you also have to know how much salt to put yes. on it, because if you put too much, it ruins. If I add Lowry seasoning garlic after I've, I've marinated it with the dales or whatever, it's too much salt. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean. Michelle knows all of <laughs> She knows her salt. Stay tuned for more of <laughs> One of the things that Paul recognizes here is just the power of our words, I think. Uh, they, they do matter. And they do have an effect on people, both the good and the harsh. And so he wants us to be mindful of that, full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that, as Michelle was saying, it's palatable, not unpalatable. So, uh, I wonder also just, you know, salt is a preservative, so the goal is to be able to preserve relationship, to be able to walk away from it, having them having the other person experience from you the picture of Christ, which is the way he deals with us, grace, mercy, love, always another chance, redemptive. You're, you're preserving that person and your relationship with that person, hopefully. That's good. All right. Uh, so I wanted to say a few things about the complexity of leadership communication. Uh, so it's an understatement to say that communication in general is just significant, is very complex. Uh, and there's a lot that goes into it. And for leaders, we bear the responsibility for making sure that this is, is done well. And so I gave you a diagram about uh, communication and uh, some different a brief description of the different people involved. I think that early communication models provided a single direction model of communication where one person was the communicator and they sent the message and the other person was a receiver. But more current communication models have two communicators. And I think it's necessary and I think helpful to think about the fact that uh, communication is always a dialogue not a monologue, right? It's two ways. And so I do, I may have something to say, but I want to make sure that uh, I'm always giving the opportunity to listen, that I'm listening as well. And so there's always a dialogue rather than a monologue. Something else to think about is just this whole concept of filters. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, communication is always filtered through the lenses of the people involved. And those lenses serve as filters as people encode and decode messages. And so you've all had those experiences where you said something to somebody and they heard something completely different. And that's the result of the filter in which they received that message. And so communicators uh, need to pay attention to the words that are used, the words that are not used, or what is assumed, or what is left unspoken or unwritten, how all of those things <coughs> communicate something. And uh, it, it, it's helpful to be aware of all of that. Um, the emotions involved, the, pers the perspectives involved, the social locations involved, <laughs> the histories that influence the various communicators and their point of view, what they're going through in their lives at any given time. Uh, these filters can be unconscious or conscious. They can be chosen or unchosen. Uh, there's blind spots. There's all kinds of messy, delightful things 
in the filters. So if I gave you a message, please complete this project by Friday at noon. What different filters could that be filtered through? That ought to get started till Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> right? What else? It's not really that important, so you don't need it by, until Friday. Friday at noon. All right, what else? What if you're feeling overwhelmed when I gave you that message? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Does he even know what all I have to do yes. between now and Friday? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what if you're very detail oriented? <laughs> Start now. Yeah, oh my gosh. It's Wednesday. And so, I mean, it's, some, it's just a simple message. Please complete this by Friday at noon. can turn into something just dependent. And that's just all of the filters. Then uh, you have to think about um, the, the message itself, uh, something that is both valuable and clear to call others to in the communication process. So the contents of leader messages will be diverse and numerous. The leaders must be clear on a, a few key messages. And Patrick Lincioni talks about six vital questions uh, that organizational leaders need to have answers to. Why do we exist? How do we behave? What do we do? How will we succeed? What is most important right now? And who must do that thing? You know, uh, we must be communicating messages that are compassionate for the people who are part of what we're doing and also help us to stay on task for the purpose that we are gathered together. Something else to consider, the channels, uh, the mediums for transmitting intended messages. So what are all the different channels or mediums for communication in our society today? Text. Texting. Texting. Cell phones. Cell phones. Email. Email. Nonverbal. Nonverbal. Verbal face-to-face. Uh, it can be on Zoom as well. Tone. Right? Tone. The tone, body language, tone of voice, the tone of voice, all of those, and more, uh, all kinds of ways to transmit messages in our world today. Uh, they tell us that most communicative acts that are effective will use multiple channels simultaneously, mm -hmm. and so we struggle with that here at the church. Communication is a big deal, uh, and we. It's always a fail. Yes, no matter what you do, it's a fail. So how do we how do we get the word out? We have to do everything. Mm -hmm. You have to and throw it against the wall and hope some of it sticks, uh, because there's so many different ways that people are paying attention, and so it all it all matters. Also, to think about noise or interference. In this, an easy example of this is you remember when we were all doing Zoom meetings and classes and that sort of thing, and uh, when the internet connection was, was slow and people would glitch out, and uh, how so annoying that is. So but, it's capital, capital. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but do we do that also uh, in person? What's the noise, the interference, even like in face-to-face in -face meetings? Our inner voice. Yes. <laughs> Daydreaming. The inner dialogue. The squeaky chair. The squeaky chair. The AC. Yes. The, the uh, temperature of the room. The phone. That can noise. The distraction. The devil. The devil. The the devil. It is. It is. You're talking to someone is. and they're, they're, oh, they're not listening. Uh, or were you just clicking your pen? Yes. The Kim is. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's, a, Which is, yes. it's a big deal. So. There's always going to be interference in the room uh, when it comes to the message. The last thing to think about is the feedback and just to make sure that I'm giving a chance for it. Uh, I want to hear. What do you have to say about it? You know, what, what did you hear me say? 
what are you hearing? And so there's this constant communication loop. Uh, it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And we want to be speaking and listening. Uh, the next thing I gave you just uh, serving others through clear communication. Although communication is complex, leaders can prioritize core aspects of the communication process that help make the complexities a bit more manageable. And so one starting point to this is remembering whom leaders serve in their work. Healthy leadership is not primarily about serving the needs of leaders. Healthy leadership is about serving the needs of others, followers, and those served by the organization. And so I want to make sure that I'm communicating to express the heart of my servant leadership. The goal is not speaking, but understanding. So it's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And also the goal is not teaching, but learning. The goal is not information transmission, but insight and change lives. So clarity is the goal. We want to be as clear as possible. Uh, so the, for the transformational servant leader, the focus of communication is not on what leaders have said or written, but rather on what followers understand and are implementing. implementing. Uh, one of the things that we talk about, you know, when I was studying leadership, uh, and then I studied it from a systems point of view, one of the things you have to come to terms with early on is your lack of control. And so anytime you give instructions to anyone, often that's the end of it, and it takes on a life of its own. And so uh, I want to make sure that I've when I have the chance that I've communicated as clearly as possible and that I've given them the chance to implement what needs to be done for the sake of the organization. But it takes on a life of its own. And that's okay. That's okay. And I have to resist the need to micromanage all of that. But we'll talk more about this next week when we talk, when we talk about accountability. But I want to make sure that I'm communicating so that Followers will understand and have a chance to implement what's needed. You know, that, I'm, that I'm making sure that I'm communicating in a way that helps them to succeed. So I gave you three suggestions here. First, to have a clear message. It's difficult to overestimate the importance of communicating with clarity. Uh, someone once said that leaders need to take time to clarify what they personally care about and want for their organization. So it is not sufficient simply to know what the message of the organization is. Leaders also need to find their voice and message in the midst of their leadership work. Because if leaders do not know what matters to them in their work as a leader, then their communication will come off as inauthentic. Why does it matter to me? So as the pastor of the church, it's not enough for me to say that uh, the mission of First Baptist Church is to be to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Christ. And that's a good mission statement, which it is. I need to be able to say why that mission statement matters to me. And so I've done a lot of thinking about this over the years, obviously. And so I have easy answers. Uh, the, being shaped by the love of Christ is important to me because I am loved by Christ. That's my testimony. And Jesus loves and accepts me as I am and not as I should be because I will never be as I should be. And all is grace. And I shape my life as a loving response to that grace. And God's Spirit uses the word to shape my life with love so I can be more like Jesus. And even though I will always be imperfect and incomplete, I am always loved by Jesus. And nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. I could go on. I mean, why does being shaped by the love of Christ matter to me? I have an answer to that. We all need to have an answer to the why. Why does the organizations of which we're a part generally have mission statements? But so what? What does that matter to us? How have we personalized that? And especially in leadership roles, 
We want to be able to communicate why these organizations and their purposes mean so much to us. And I've had to do that with the church over the years. So you'll want to think about what are your core messages? What are you ready to share about those in a way that's thoughtful and meaningful, even at a moment's notice? The second suggestion I gave you was to be competent communicators. <laughs> communicators are both senders and receivers. This means that leaders must nurture a diverse set of competencies as leaders, including speaking and listening and being open to the ideas of others and having personal conviction and seeking to understand while also being understood by others. And so the goal is competency, not perfection. So I want to make sure that I'm a good listener and uh, in trying to understand, I definitely don't agree with everything I hear that people are putting out there, and that's okay. But uh, it's important that people feel heard and understood. Two different things. Mm -hmm. Validating someone, hearing and understanding what they're saying does not equal agreement right. with what they're saying. Two different things. Mm -hmm. And we need to be sure as in our society, especially right now, that we're separating that. And, uh, I want to take them seriously, and agreeing with them is a totally different what I really want to do is to communicate that I understand, and then hopefully have the opportunity to communicate what I think in a way that they will be able to understand it as well. And so we want to be competent as leaders in all of these different kinds of uh, communication skills. Catherine and I have that discussion a lot. What's that? Because she will take, she will say something to me, I understand what she has said, I don't agree with what she said. And she says, you're not listening to me. And I will say, oh, yes, I'm listening to you. I don't have to agree with it. And I don't. I still understand what you're saying, but I don't agree with it. And that's not the same as I don't hear you. And so, you know, in those situations, of course, you can't do this always with teenage girls, unfortunately. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But to say, I, re I respect you enough to, to try to work hard to understand what you were saying and to hear you. I need you to respect me now and what I believe. And uh, that'll go over like a lead balloon. <laughs> what did Dinah say? Shh. <laughs> yes. All right, the third thing I said uh, was to use compelling channels. Channels are the mediums by which intended messages are shared among communicators. Basic channels include verbal, written, and nonverbal mediums. But each of these mediums can be used in either face-to-face -face or distributed pathways, synchronous, asynchronous, asynchronous pathways, or physical or digital pathways. And so the point is to consider all the different options we have for communicating. We want to use as much as we can to make sure that uh, we're communicating in a way that people will hear it. Know your audience, know how to communicate with those folks, how do they hear, how do they listen, and uh, to use all of the means available to us to get the message out. If it's worth communicating, if the message is so important, it's worth communicating it well in a way that people will hear it and uh, receive it. All right, questions tonight? Comments? We've covered a lot of ground. It's good. <coughs> well, for you, it's good. Yeah, so next week, I have, I have in mind that we'll meet at five. And then the first family meeting is at six. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. So I don't know what that does to all of your schedules, but there's no way around it. The law says we have to have these quarterly business meetings. The law. <laughs> the man. And so we need to have them in this time. And, uh, but I want us to not belabor this class beyond Thanksgiving. So I'd like to get this wrapped up before Thanksgiving. Um, we'll meet at five next week, and we'll talk about accountability.
which is a joy. Yeah, be here for four or five, so you're accountable. That's right. I'll try to send you a reminder. Okay, let me pray first. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, that you've called us to be a part of your mission and your purposes. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand that calling and that that mission to internalize it in such a way that we can communicate to others the importance of it, how you are important to us, how what you've done is important, how what you're doing in the world is important, how we give our lives to that is important. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be mindful of the ways that we communicate with people in our family our friends, and in the organizations we're a part of, and maybe where we work. Um, Help us to serve others by being as clear as possible, and by being good listeners, and to speak in a way that will bring about what is best for others. Lord, I know there are a lot of people who are going to be here tonight, and they're scattered hither and yon. I pray that you would bless them and provide what they need. Lord, we love you. We are so thankful. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah, I see that. Oh. Did that together. That <laughs> 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 <laughs>